I am so ready because we're in the middle of a series called Not Gonna Bow. That we're going to learn to stand up to the culture and the climate of the world that we're in. We're in week number two and we're going to call this today uh, that, uh, that Not Gonna Bow. We're, we're going to stand up to the culture that's pushing back and trying to push God out. And we're learning how to rise up and stand to be the people of God that he's called us to be in a generation that's seen so much adversity. How many of you have, uh, could say, in 2020, I've seen more division than I've ever seen in our nation? I know that to be the truth. But we as Christians don't have to fight with the weapons that the world fight with. We don't have to get on social media. We don't have to push back. And if you missed last week, I want to encourage you to go back and listen to the message. It's called Don't Blend. You can't be afraid to stand out. Because if you stand up for God, how many of you know you're going to stand out? If you stand up, you're going to stand out. And you don't want to miss next week. We're going to be talking about how that you can stand up in the face of opposition. When you take a stand for God, the world's going to push back. We're looked at as the hostiles now. We're looked at, at those that, that are, are the hate groups because we're standing for God's word because we don't just let people do anything that they want to as far as morally and ethically. And so the enemy is going to put a bullseye on your back. And I need to tell you that up front, that when you take a stand for God, you're going to feel like your life is targeted. You're going to have people that come against you. There are going to be standards that you set when you take a godly stand for God's word. How many of you know just because someone says they're a Christian doesn't mean they adhere to godly standards? Let me say it again. Just because someone in 2020 says that they're a Christian, that does not mean that they adhere to godly standards and godly biblical principles. And so when you begin to take a stand for what the Word of God says, not what popular Christian opinion says, when you start sticking to the Word, you're going to stick out and you're going to get pushback from the world. Now, I have to tell you, today is going to be a difficult subject. We don't shy away from those, and it's a possibility that you could misunderstand what I'm trying to say and take me in the wrong way. So I'm wanting you to open your ears up big and listen. Because let's be honest, some people are overly confrontational. Teaching this message is like he t giving you a stick of dynamite. When I tell you to, to, that we need to stand up, people are like, give it to me. I'll stand up. I, I'm ready to put people in their place. I'm ready to tell everybody where they're wrong and how that I'm right. Because there are people that are itching to enlighten someone. They're going to be the superhero of the church to right all wrongs. They're going to be able to stand up and be confrontational in a flash. And so you've got to be careful when you do a message like this because it's like a bull in a china shop. Then you've got other people that are passive. They're not so confrontational. So I want to take a poll. How many of you would say that I am non-confrontational? You're non-confrontational. Lift your hand. Okay. Everybody look around. Lift them up. Some of you didn't even want to raise because that's just too confrontational. I just don't, I, I don't want to stir, rock the boat. Now, where are my people that you would say, I have no problem being confrontational? Man, all of them threw their hands up. They're just like, man, I'm here. Who, who, who needs help? Who needs my input? Who needs my insight? And so those people are not afraid to raise their hands. And, and given the right direction, those people can help a lot of people out. But with this message, it's going to be challenging. Because there's two extremes when it comes to being confrontational. You as a Christian, we've got to learn there are going to be times where you're not going to want to confront things if you're not confrontational. But for the health of everyone around you and for your sanity and for the health of the church, you've got to learn to confront things and sometimes confront them head on. Here's the reason there's two extremes. Number one, some people tend to be more unwilling to confront. Some people tend to be more unwilling to confront. We tend to rationalize it with phrases like, well, it's none of my business. It's, not, it's live and let live. I'm not perfect either, so who am I to judge? They're too non-confrontational, and they don't help anything. If you're too passive and you just let things happen, you say, well, I'll let everybody else handle it. The other extreme is we're too eager, and we confront unlovingly. People that are too confrontational often do it unlovingly, and they're too happy to do it. They're ready to put people in their place to set the record straight. And they don't often have any relationship with the people that they're trying to correct. But I'm going to tell you that you're wrong and why I'm right. And that's especially prevalent on social media. People that don't even know you do drive-by corrections. They're not even on your friends list and they hijack your post. How many of you had that happen? Like, who are you? And why are you stepping in on my conversation? You post something on there, they jump in, they try to correct you because they're the writer of all wrongs. Welcome to 2020. So what do you do? Because these are difficult times that we live in. 
And we got to learn to speak up and confront things. Well, first, we got to have godly wisdom. You got to have wisdom to know how and when to do these things. We have to confront in the right way we talked about last week at the right time and for the right reasons. We don't just willy-nilly go out there and start correcting things and confronting all things. We've got to know that there's a right way, a right time, and a right reason to confront someone. Because when you're a follower of Christ, there are going to be opportunities that come across your path where you just can't be silent. Where your silence could harm other people. And because you do it because you love them. That is the key. When you love someone, if I'm in error and you don't correct me and you could save me heartache down the road, do you really love me? Or do you love your comfort more than you love me in helping me get back on the right path? Because so many times we're just like, well, it's none of my business. I just don't want to get involved. If you love someone, it's your business to help them to be the best version of themselves. If you stand here at arm's length with everybody and you don't give anyone any opportunity to get into your life and speak into your life, you're going to be a very lonely person that has to learn from your mistakes. But I love when other people love me enough to come to me. When I know that they love me and I'm in relationship with them and they come to me and say, hey, what you said wasn't so good. Hey, how you said that didn't come across. You could be misinterpreted. And we could get all defensive and say, well, that's not what I meant. Well, that's why I'm telling you. I know that's not how you meant it. So that's why I'm telling you. Well, then we get all defensive and we want to start blowing back and then you're going to shut people out and they're not going to want to talk to you and confront you at all. But we as a church, we will be the healthiest church that I've ever been a part of if we can learn to confront things in love in each other's lives and help sharpen one another. The Bible says iron sharpens iron. And if you've ever heard that phrase and you've heard me quote it, I'm going to tell you, you can't sharpen iron without heat, sparks, and friction. If you tell me that you have friendships that you never have conflict in, then you probably don't talk a whole lot. But I love when I've got friendships where we can disagree. Sometimes heatedly disagree to where we sometimes have to just say, hey, let's step back from this a moment. But we learn to love one another and we make each other better in the process. That wasn't even in my notes. You got that all for free. Let's say you're a parent and your child's making bad decisions. Or let me rephrase that. Let's say you're a parent and all children make bad decisions. And you need to know what to do and the right time to do it in. And so you don't want to push too hard and push them away. Because, see, the goal is you want to bring your child back to God. You don't want to push them away and shove the church and the Bible and everything down their throat. So you want to lovingly, you want to eat in front of them in such a way that makes them want what you have. Because here's the thing. Anyone that has drifted from God, they might be out there in the world. But the world, it, the Bible tells us that sin is fun for a season. And guess what? That season is over at some point, And they're going to have to reap the consequences of what they've sown. So we lovingly step out and say, hey, listen, what you're doing right now is not going to bring good results in your life. Or maybe you've got a family member that's making terrible financial decisions. And the longer you wait to say something, the bigger, bigger their hole and the deeper their hole gets that they're digging. And over time, it's going to be devastating to them and they're going to expect you to bail them out so it's going to be cheaper on you to confront it now than to confront it when they're $15,000 in debt. And so the thing is, is that we got to speak up and help and love and say, hey, listen, there's a better way to do your finances. Take Financial Peace University with me this fall at my church and we'll help you learn those things. Maybe your best friend or your accountability partner is making some terrible sexual decisions in their life. And because you love them, you want what's best for them. You say, hey, listen, you don't need to be flirting with that person at work. You you don't need to be doing this. And we confront them because sometimes that's the most sensitive area to, to, to confront somebody in. Is the decisions to confront them based on what they're looking at on the internet or are those kind of things. And I want to lovingly speak today as your pastor that if you're older you're an older adult and you're single or you're divorced and single keep it pure never cross the lines there is not an age uh, delineation on purity in the bible that sex outside of marriage is sin regardless of what the driver's license birth date says on your card Amen? amen amen Amen? All right, so, so here's the thing. If you've been out there test driving things, this, you don't get to test drive those things if, if, uh, before you marry them. You, you, if you want it, put a ring on it. All right, so let's go on. It wasn't in my notes either. Because you might, you might have a friend that's always negative 
are, there are judgmental pain in the rear end. Anybody got those friends? All right, all the confrontational people. Yes, and I've talked to them about it. All right, so anything. It seems like every family has that confrontational, negative, judgmental family member. And, and, and believe it or not, we're just a couple of months away from the holiday seasons. Can you believe that? All right. So the holidays are quickly here. You know, Hobby Lobby's already put up all the fall and the Christmas stuff. And the, wow. So anyway, and if you say, well, I don't have that confrontational pain in the rear end family member in my family. I'm just going to leave that one right there. Um, it might be you. All right. So here's the thing. We all have those family members that can be jerky. We all have those family members that seem to want to catch you up on last year's gossip and catch you up on everybody's lives and they cut people down. And there's going to come a point where you're finally going to have to stand up and say, hey, listen, we're family and we don't need to do this. And your words and your actions are hurting people. And so I'm bringing it to your attention because I love you and because you're my family and I don't want this to keep happening. Because I'm convinced that if more people could learn to speak the truth in love, and that's the key, speak the truth in love and confront other people, we'd be better off for it. Because we're in a time where too many people are speaking and not enough people are listening. Let me say that again. We're living in a time right now where too many people are speaking and not enough people are listening. And I'm going to talk to you about that in just a few moments. And, I, and my experience is young people handle confrontation a lot better than older people do. We get defensive. It's kind of like that elephant that's in the room. I had someone in church a few years ago that came up to me and said, I don't know why. I, I just can't seem to keep any friends. Everybody deserts me. and I don't have, Nobody ever asked me to go to lunch. Nobody ever asked me to do anything. I'm losing friends all the time. Well, I knew why. But nobody wanted to tell them because they were such a caustic personality. And so I sat down with them and I said, I know why you can't keep friends. Oh, you do? Well, tell me. I said, do you really want me to tell you? Because you're pushy, you're overbearing, you're negative, and you're hard to get along with. Well, that took guts to say it, but I said it because I love that person. Unfortunately, they got mad and they no longer attend our church. And the thing is, and I don't say that because it was a, a great feat, but the thing is, is that I did my best to love that person to help them. Because they always saw people come into their life and the, the back door was bigger than the front door. People kept coming in and more people were leaving and they felt lonely and isolated. But they couldn't embrace the fact that the problem lied within themselves. And so they were hard to get along with. They were negative. They were pushy. They were overbearing. And until those things changed, that back door was going to still stay wide open. And if we could have the courage to speak the truth in love, that's the key, and sharpen one another, the differences we could make would be astounding. But it takes courage, and it takes risk. Risk losing relationships. If you love me, Proverbs 27, 6 says, the wound of a friend is better than the kiss of an enemy. That's not in your notes. You can write it down. It's one of my favorite scriptures. The wound of a friend is better than the kiss of an enemy. I want people that are willing to tell me the truth even though it may hurt if it's going to make me better. I don't want to always be that guy that tells everybody what they want to hear. James 1.19 says it this way. My dear brothers and sisters. In other words, he's softening you up. He's saying, my dear brothers and sisters. In other words, I have a relationship with you. Take note of this. In other words, this is something you're going to want to remember. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Listen a lot more than you speak and get angry about. Don't just jump up to speak. Think it through. Listen to what other people are saying. Contemplate and pray before you respond. Before you say words that you're going to regret. Be slow to anger and slow to blast people on social media and make passive aggressive posts. Don't say something to someone on social media that you don't have the courage to say to them in person. And pray to be a godly influence and put a godly filter on your life. So that's what we're going to look at today. We haven't even gotten into the message. Look at Daniel. We're going to be looking at, at five stories throughout this series of five different characters in the book of Daniel and how they responded to life. In Daniel chapter 4, that's where we're going to dig in today. And we're going to look. We talked about last week Babylon's king Nebuchadnezzar. King Nebuchadnezzar was one of the most evil rulers of that day. And to give you an idea of how wicked he was, many of you remember Saddam Hussein, those of you that are older. Saddam Hussein was the former ruler of Iraq. And Iraq sits right directly where Babylon used to be. And Hussein 
He said in interviews that King Nebuchadnezzar was his idol. It was his, his ultimate hero. As a matter of fact, if you Google it, he believed that he was King Nebuchadnezzar reincarnated. It's true. And Nebuchadnezzar was wicked. He was crazy. And, and, and they saw da uh, Daniel and his friends firsthand how crazy things got. But God was moving. And God was trying to get his attention. And so much so that Nebuchadnezzar every once in a while would turn his heart towards God and then he would go back to his old ways. And then he would feel convicted and he would see God moving in Daniel and his friends and he would go back to trying to acknowledge God and then he would go back to his evil ways. And it was kind of this back and forth between good and evil. And in the midst of all the back and forth, God gave Nebuchadnezzar this crazy dream. And he called on everybody that he knew to interpret dreams, his seers and, and all those people. And he was freaked out by the dream and he couldn't sleep. But no one wanted to interpret the dream for the king. Now, if you read some biblical uh, uh, version, Bible versions, some say they couldn't interpret the dreams. Other versions and interpretations say that they, they wouldn't interpret it. Because, see, if you told the king something he didn't want to hear, he'd have you put to death many times. They didn't want to say, hey, you know, I know what it means. It's not that I don't know. It's just that I don't want you to know and you be mad at me because I'm just the messenger. Don't kill the messenger. And so they didn't want to tell him what the dream meant because it was so plain and clear that almost a child could tell you what this, this uh, dream meant. So they all kind of played dumb like they didn't have it, a clue. So the king brought Daniel in. And when, and when Daniel first came to Babylon, he was about 14 to 15 years old. But when the king had this dream, now Daniel is about 45 to 50 years old. So he's a little more aged, a little more seasoned. He's got decades of time of building relationship with Nebuchadnezzar. And honestly, at this point, he loved Nebuchadnezzar. He built a friendship and a relationship with him. And the king comes to him and says, here's my dream. I dreamed that there was a giant, giant tree that reached up towards the heavens and the branches and the leaves gave shade to all the people and blessed them. The animals lived in the trees and, and the tree produced fruit that fed the people. But suddenly, a holy one from heaven shouted, cut down the tree and only leave a stump so that everyone would know that God is the most high God and rules over the nations. So he looks at Daniel and says, so what does this mean? And Daniel knew what it means. But what were his options? Wow, that's a tough one. I don't really know. Or sorry, king, I don't do dreams anymore. Maybe you ate too much pizza last night, so you know, you know, maybe it wasn't that bad. Or he could tell him the truth and tell him the truth in love. And if you read the rest of the story, that's exactly what Daniel did. He was willing to tell the king the truth in love. And I don't know about you, but dreams mean means something. If you read, there was an article in the Huffington Post that said if you, you have different dreams, and I'll tell you a few of them, that, that if you ever had a dream that you were following, how many of you had a dream that you were following? What well, says that symbolizes that there's something in your life that feels out of control that really concerns you. I don't know how real this is, but this is what it says. Have you ever forgotten about an exam or a test when you were younger? It means that there's something you feel unprepared for. Ever dreamed that you were stuck, like you couldn't get out of somewhere? Well, that means that you feel overwhelmed by something. You ever dreamed that you were being chased? Well, that means that you feel like there's something in your life that you're not addressing that you need to address. Have you ever dreamt that, that you had to go to the bathroom? Wake up. That's not a dream. All right. Wake up. I promise you. From experience, I can promise you that is not the case. All right. So wake up. Or if you ever dreamed that you all of a sudden woke up and you were naked in public, that means that you feel emotionally or psychologically exposed or vulnerable in an area of your life. So let's go back to the king's dream. I think dreams mean something. And we've got the king and we've got this big tree and it's being told to cut the tree down. And, it, and Daniel starts to interpret it and, and he says, here's what it means. King, O king, is what Daniel says. I wish this applied to your enemies. He's showing that he actually genuinely loved and cared for the king. I wish this was not true for you. And in verse 22 he says, your majesty, you are that tree. You have become great and strong and your greatness has grown until it reaches the sky and your dominion extends to the distant parts of the earth. He goes on in verse 25 and, says, and he translates the dream. He says, you'll be driven away from the people and will live like, with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox and be drenched with the dew of heaven. In other words, you're going to crawl around like a wild animal on all fours. Verse 25. Seven times or seven years will pass before you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all the kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you. 
when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Now, he could have just stopped there because he did everything that the king asked him to do. He interpreted the dream. And he could have easily just walked away from that. But Daniel did something that could have risked his life. And he didn't leave it just there. He stood up to the king not because he was proud of himself. He stood up to the king not because he wanted to correct him or, or because he thought he was better than the king. He stood up to the king because he loved the king. And in verse 27 it says, King Nebuchadnezzar, please accept my advice. In other words, I care for you and I want what's best for you. Stop sinning and do what's right. Stop sinning and do what's right. In fact, anytime you're going to lovingly correct someone, that kind of summarizes what your, your whole purpose is. You want someone to be better than where they're at right now. You lovingly want people to be right with God. That's the whole goal of confrontation. I want you to stop what you're doing right now that's hurting your relationship with God. And I want you to listen. I want you to stop doing it so that you can be right with God. And he goes on to say, break from your wicked past and be merciful to the poor. Stop oppressing the people. God's given you influence. Be a blessing to the people that serve in your kingdom and be merciful to the poor. Perhaps then you will continue to prosper. In other words, King, please do what's right and God's going to bless you. Now, I don't know when it will be and I don't know under what circumstances, but if you're a follower of Jesus and you're in relationship with other Christians and you're doing life with one another, there's going to come times where you're going to have to confront people. We're going to be called to stand up to someone against an issue that is not right and help them get back on God's path. If you love someone, you want them to be right where they're supposed to be with God. So God's going to call you to stand up and say the hard things. And he's going to give you the words if you'll seek him. In fact, I want to tell you something that mirrors this in the New Testament. Galatians chapter 6 verse 1. It says, dear brothers and sisters, in other words, Christians, if another believer is overcome by sin, some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back on to the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. You don't help them arrogantly. You don't do it harshly. You don't tell them, stop sinning, you're going to go to hell. You help them get back on the right path. And I love the picture that that paints for us because I'm doing this because I love you. I do it because I care. You're my brother or my sister in Christ. And I want you to be the best version of yourself. And if we can do this as a church, we will be one of the healthiest churches I've ever been a part of. Very people, few people love confrontation. But we've got to learn to confront each other in love. Because when you put yourself in relationship with people, you have to care about them enough to help them be everything that God's called them to be. And it says, and be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. So we've got to be prayerful because we can confront somebody with something and, and in pride we could fall into the very same thing. So when you're called to confront someone, number one, if you're taking notes, your prayer has got to be, Lord, help me to confront with restoration as my goal. Help me to confront with restoration as my goal. We want to help somebody get back on the right path and, and be right with God. And not, I'm here to set you right, straight. I'm not here to, to right all your wrongs. That can't be your motive. But verse 1 says, gently and humbly help that person back on the right path. It reminds me of a story that I told just recently to some of the young people. I was a youth pastor. I'd only been a youth pastor for a few years. And I got up and every Wednesday night I preached my heart out. I mean, I told these young people, here's the path and here's the one you got to be on to follow God. And if you're not on this path, you know, it's a road that leads to destruction. And I had one of my leaders come up to me after a few weeks and they said, can I be honest with you? And I was like, if you tell me I did good, you know, but I didn't say that. But I was like, you can be honest if it's flattering, but if it's going to make me hurt and make me feel bad, don't do it. But she sat down and she said, you keep telling these kids every week everything they're doing wrong. You're pointing out all the sin in their life, but you're not telling them how to stop sinning. You're not telling them how to be right. Well, I got defensive and I got mad because I felt like she questioned my heart. Well, my heart was never to just point out the wrong and not give them the solution. But after everything settled in the, in that night and I was by myself and I started thinking, and I was like, oh my gosh, she's right. Every single week, 
How, how horrible would it be to sit here and listen to me every week and listen to me tell you everything that's wrong with your life but then not tell you how to make it right? And so I, I changed how I preached. I changed how I delivered my messages. And I not only pointed out the problem, then I came along with a solution. I also, I hate getting ugly emails, but I get them fairly frequently. <laughs> and I've had to learn to eat the meat and spit out the bones. People angry at me. And honestly, if you don't sign your name to it and you write me an anonymous note, it goes right in the trash can and I'm not even going to read it. Because that's a coward's email. That's a coward's note. And if you, if you don't have the, the courage to confront me in love with relationship and put your name on it so we can talk about it because there might be some truth. If you're going to do that, then, then I'm not even going to give it the time of day. And I don't do drive-by confrontations on social media. But the thing is that I want relationship with people. And I grant, I feel like I'm a very open person, and I grant people access that if I'm doing something that you can help me to be better at, iron sharpening iron, I'm going to give you access to that. And so when I get the hateful emails and those kind of things, I'll, I will read the ones that are signed and those kind of things, and then I will eat the meat and spit out the bones because I, I want to be better. And not everybody tells you the truth in love, but it's still, it's still truth, and you still have to, to digest it. But that's why I tell you there's so much importance in being in a connect group. I've had somebody go, I'm get so tired of that church pushing connect groups. Because we know they work. I am a better husband, a better father, and a better man from being in relationship with other people in this church, other men in this church that I get to spend time with that make me better than what I am because I give them access. And it happens through connect groups. And none of us have the free time. An hour or two to go to a connect group because we could be doing something else that we think is more productive. But you know what? I make time for what I deem to be important. And I believe that relationships are important. And I can't be a better version because we all have blind spots. I have blind spots. And if I could see it, it wouldn't be called a blind spot. This last week, I backed into my sister-in-law's car. Made me sick. Why? Because it was in my blind spot. And I hit it. Now I feel better. I confess that. All right, so, and I'm sorry, Christy. But anyway, that's why I push connect groups. Because if church, Christianity was about just going to church when it's convenient and just going when you can, you're missing the point. The second thing that we got to know is that when we confront is, Lord, help me confront with caution. Lord, help me confront with caution. Gently and humbly. Humbly help people get back on the right path. Because here's the thing, you're vulnerable to pride when you confront people. Because you could feel like, well, you know, you could, you know, I, I helped them, I, I set them straight, and you know, I, at least I don't have that problem. And if we're not careful, we can become prideful in ourselves. Well, God used me to set that person straight, and you know, and it, God used me in their life. And here's the reality. If you're concerned about a specific issue in someone's life, lovingly confront them. But if you keep confronting the same things over and over again in different people's lives, it could be that there's an area in your life we tend to confront and correct the things that we struggle with in our own lives. Because you ever notice that somebody that always complains about people being negative or gossiping are usually the most negative and gossiping people? Y'all have never noticed that? You need to pay attention then. Because the, the people that get upset when people are negative and gossip the most are usually the ones that are chief offenders. So we've got to be careful. And the last thing I want is a church full of people that are against each other. I'm not saying Pastor Derek said I have to go and confront three people before the sun goes down tonight. I'm not telling you that. This is not about you going and confronting people, but when the opportunity comes available. And if somebody's continuing to hurt you. If someone's continuing to do the same thing, they could be ignorant of it. And you just get more and more hurt and you get more and more upset. Because you didn't confront it. And I guarantee you, if you're friends with them and if they love you, they wouldn't keep doing it. And they just need to be made aware of it because sometimes we're ignorant. How many of you have ever been ignorant of something that you've been doing and you didn't, you didn't do it on purpose, you just didn't know you were doing it? All right, look at all the hands. So you can't keep being mad at something that you didn't confront. So Daniel goes, oh, king, I love you. I wish this didn't apply to you and I wish it were for your enemies, but it does apply to you. 
and here's what it means. And I humbly ask you to accept my advice and stop sinning and do what's right because if you do, you're going to continue to prosper and God will bless you. So what does King Nebuchadnezzar do? He doesn't go, oh, you're right, forgive me, my bad, let's take communion and sing Amazing Grace together. He doesn't do that. He continues to rebel against God and everything that happened in the dream came true. And some of you right now, you're going to get a prompting from the Holy Spirit. And you're going to get it right. You're not going to be overly confrontational. You're not going to be arrogant. You're not going to be harsh. And you're going to lovingly confront your family member or your brother and sister in Christ. And you're going to win them. But hear this. When you confront somebody, you're not responsible for their response. You're not responsible with how they receive it, but you are responsible for how you say it. Speak the truth in love. How you say it matters. And in verse 34, at the end of time, which was seven years, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven, and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High, and I honored and glorified Him who lives forever. So seven years later... The evil king repents and he turns to God. Because Daniel had the courage to speak the truth, he didn't listen right away. It took seven long years for the truth to come to fruition. And you might speak the truth to someone and they still choose their own path, but you still had the courage to confront in love and speak the truth in love. And church, we've got to be that kind of church. We can't keep going around being upset with each other, mad at each other, disgruntled with one another, hurt with one another. There's been more people that have left High Point Church and other churches because they got upset about something they weren't willing to confront. Somebody hurt their feelings or somebody said something, and so I'm packing my toys up and I'm going home. And then they get mad that you didn't chase them and tell them not to go home. And you didn't even know they were leaving. Because can I tell you right now, during this pandemic, we're running about seven to 800 people every week. Before all this, we were 1,800. Easy. There's a good thousand people still watching online or doing whatever. So to be honest with you, I don't know who goes to High Point Church anymore. Except for those that are sitting here in front of me. There might be some of you watching at home right now mad because nobody's called and said they missed you. And we didn't know that we were supposed to miss you because we don't know who all's missing. You getting what I'm saying? And the enemy sets us up so often to get our feelings hurt. To want to pack up our toys and go home. And we've got to stop and put on our big boy and big girl britches. And learn to confront the things that hurt us. Learn to confront the issues in our friends and family's lives that's hurting them. And let's do this thing and do life together. That, my friends, is a family. That's a church. And it can be messy and it can be ugly. It can be painful even. I've had many surgeries that were painful, but they were worth worth the pain that I went through to be healthy. And some of you right now, during this message, you sit here and you know that there's some things that you need to confront. Maybe in your own life. And it might be painful at first, but the help on the other side of it will be worth it. Don't bow. Stand up and help people be the best that they can be. And again, church, if we can grasp this, we'll be one of the most healthy churches I've ever seen. Bow your heads with me. Father, help us to lovingly Help our fellow believers, our family, and help them to receive it. Help us to to make each other better, to iron sharpening iron. Now listen, with your head still bowed and your eyes still closed, the most loving thing I could say is if you aren't serving Jesus, you need to. He wants to forgive you of your sins and help you to get back on the right track. Just like King Nebuchadnezzar, he wants you to turn from your sin. And he wants to have a relationship with you. And so if you don't know Jesus and you want to know him today, then I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And everybody's going to pray it with you out loud. You're not going to be doing it by yourself. So let's pray this together. Dear Lord, I ask you to come into my heart. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. And today I give you my life. And I want to thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name. 